How's it going, everyone? This is Pete from the Lasser Cast, where every so often we get a chance to interview horror writers. And I am super excited today to be talking to Lucas Amon, who is the uh, screenwriter and director and also novelist that's going to be joining us today. Um, he just wrote this beautiful book called Warmth, which I had the chance to read, and we're going to be discussing that today. I wanted to make sure I pronounced your name right. It's Lucas Amon, right? Yes, and you may be the only person in my life that has ever guessed it right without having heard it first. Okay, well, I did hear it first. I heard it right from the mouth of Doug Bradley. So oh, right on. He pronounced it right, yeah. <laughs> so so Lucas's book, which was put out by Encyclopocalypse, um, the audiobook also came out. They are really great about putting out audiobooks. And he his book was narrated by Pinhead himself, Doug Bradley. So that's pretty yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, that was a thrill for sure. Yeah, I've been a, a lifelong fan of his and of Hellraiser. So uh, I was pumped to have him. Yeah. What's that like just like finding out that he's going to be the narrator of your first novel? I mean, it was it was insane. Uh, uh, Mark is Mark's the publisher. You know, Mark was talking about uh, getting him, uh, pursuing him. Uh, and they have a relationship have had for many years. Uh, so I thought it'd be amazing if you could, you know, I was just sort of uh, crossing my fingers, hoping for the best, but not expecting much. And then uh, Doug came back to us and said he loved the book and wanted to do it. And, uh, you know, I thought uh, it'd be just absolutely insane to have him. And it, w and it was, I mean, the work he did on it is just beautiful. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It, it's so funny because you hear it all in his, you know, narration with his British accent and it sounds beautiful because a lot of your writing, I feel like is very poetic. And then when he would speak as the characters who were American, like, you know, they would have that American accent, but he, he really nailed that teenage boy voice, I thought. Yes, yeah, he did. Yeah, he really did. And he, he nailed the moments of humor with them, I think, too. He, listening to it, I was often giggling at uh, some of the character quirks he put in. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that was a discussion early on and a concern of his was, uh, you know, he felt like the book was very American um, and s was concerned somewhat about his accent. But I thought actually, um, I mean, personally, I don't really think much about accents beyond like, you know, there's the first few seconds you hear it and then you're used to it. And then I no longer register it. But I, right. maybe that's not the same with everybody. Yeah. Um, but I thought anyway, I thought uh, it would be nice to have um, his sort of elegance, yes. um, the, you know, not, accent aside for the, the narration. Um, and then he had decided that he thought uh, maybe not go full American with the accents of the boys, but just to sort of step a little bit into a kind of a, a more American sort of place. Yeah, uh, at least away from his British accent to a degree. I think it worked very well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's a really great point you make about how eloquently he speaks, because um, what I said before with your story, and also I think we should kind of talk about the plot, but I, I didn't want to spoil the story for anyone, you know, anyone who hasn't read it yet. But um, essentially, there is a very uh, fantastic element to your story. And when the main characters go into this sort of fantastic world, I feel like the actual prose changes a bit. Like when they're just in the real world, I feel like that the prose is more just sort of common or, or the way you kind of expect like teenage characters to think. But then once they go into this fantastic area, I felt it got a lot more poetic. Was that intentional cool. on your part? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think to a degree, I mean, I think some of that is when I'm writing is going on, um, in the background, it's a sort of a subconscious process of, yeah. of just trying to capture like, what is the feeling of the, the moment of the scene? Yeah. Um, so, so when I'm with, uh, with teens just hanging out, for example, I don't know if it's necessarily a conscious decision that, uh, write, uh, more sort of spare prose that, and, and shorter sentences and be, you know, I think actually that's just arising from the feeling of um, imagining a scene with, with teenagers and then um, going into a, a scene in, in the cave, in the, fa the fantasy world. I, I'm probably uh, conjuring a little bit my love of like 
uh, Ballard or, or some of these writers, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering like specifically in those cave scenes, uh, like which authors sort of really inspired you because I felt like the language in there was like a lot more rich than what I'm kind of used to reading myself, especially like in horror itself. Was there specific authors that inspired you? You mentioned Ballard. Was yeah, for, else? For, for sure him. And, and specifically, I would say um, Crystal World. Uh, you know, I think like the the specificity of his descriptions in that, that would uh, really plant you in that space. Uh, and I think like the, the particular sort of details he would uh, highlight that could allow you to then fill out the rest. That's, that's, he was a big influence in that sense. Um, I don't, I don't know if I had anybody else specifically in mind. I mean, I think certainly uh, Clive Barker has been a, a lifelong influence of mine. And I think there's probably a, a taste of uh, Weave World in mm -hmm. some of the fantasy here. Mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, I had also this, this may not be as obvious, but um, I had like something wicked this way comes. Yeah, yeah. You know, Bradbury. Big time, big time in, in my mind. And that was a huge reason why I decided to go um, with a, a narrator instead of going first person with the boys, you know, so yeah. they could feel, so you could sort of step out of their perspective and, and watch them from a little bit more knowing adult space. Right, right. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I've kind of danced around the subject of the book and like what happens. Um, if you want to kind of explain it to our viewers, you know, without spoiling it, how, how would you basically pitch it to them? Yeah, well, it's about three boys, uh, teen boys. One of them kills himself at the creek where they go to smoke and drink. Um, and his blood like fertilizes the mud and grows these caverns underground that are full of uh, almost like plant-like uh, growths of his memories and other sort of totems, items of significance from his mind um, that are towards the surface, a little more chaotic. They're sort of growing over each other, but the deeper you go into these caves, you get sort of fully formed memories looping in chambers. Um, and so the other boys, especially one that had a, a romance that was cut short with the boy that killed himself, take to these caves uh, to deal with their grief. They, they're exploring, in, in a sense, for an answer why he's done this, uh, but also uh, as a way to continue their relationship with him, to continue being close to him. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's so well done. One, one of the things that I love so much about it is that you essentially have created this like tangible environment that the characters interact with and pass through. And it's, you know, you've made like memories and emotions tangible. And yeah. I think that, yeah, go ahead. No, oh, sorry. No, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think that was, um, that was a, a huge part of uh, the what if that drove me uh, to write this. It was, you know, uh, I started writing it initially after my dad passed and I would have uh, dreams of him where I got to hug him again. Um, and to, and that sort of feeling of, you know, wishing that that could be real and actually physical once yeah. you wake up, I think was a big part of it. And, and he was an artist. So, um, you know, looking at his surreal, a, a, a lot of it was very surreal sort of landscapes, looking at these sort of pictures and imagining that they could be physical spaces you could travel into and explore. You know, yeah. I think the, the that was really the, the genesis of the concept was, what if this was tangible? What if it could be? Yeah. Um, there are certain, like, I, I guess maybe a often like films that kind of remind me of this subject matter versus books. Uh, I, when it comes to um, just my exposure to fantasy and horror, I know like a lot more about like film and, and uh, you know, TV versus literature. Yeah. Um, but, but I think of like uh, what, what dreams may come, you know, the Matheson book. Sure. Yeah, sure. I, just what you said about your father and then sort of 
like wanting to go into his artwork. That sort of reminds me of the adaptation of What Dreams May Come. Oh, sure. Williams, yeah. You know? Some of the interesting sort of uh, like the dyes with the flowers and stuff. Yeah. Right. And, yes. and then another example I could think of, or essentially two, is like I think of like either like Inception or um, uh, uh, Westworld, where it's like they're, they're these sort of like worlds that you enter into and they're in like a loop and you experience characters, but they kind of say the same things over and over again because they're yeah. like on a loop, you know, and you're walking through it. Yeah. 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 Um, Fritz Lieber has a book too called um, yeah, You're All Alone, S something alone, um, where this character is like the world is uh, performing a, a script in a sense, and that something happens to this character and breaks him out of the script. And now the world continues performing as it should have. In, in his absence, but he's not there to do his part, and he's sort of walking around this space. I've uh, I've always found that kind of interesting. Characters with a, some sort of limited um, conscious life, or you know, maybe that a, a conscious life that's happening in another dimension that you're a part of, so that you're seeing it as like a stage play or something. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I. I referenced movies and i know that that is a major thing for you too like movies are a big part of your career right like yes. that's essentially mainly what you've done right this is your first novel correct right? yeah. yeah yeah i i you know i've got um uh 10 years of trying to pursue doing features with some really cool companies it's been it's been fun uh and it's been frustrating uh sure. so you know the first feature hasn't come to be yeah, either, even though that has been sort of the, the longer pursuit and the, the main pursuit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always been a, a lover of film and of novels uh, and I paint as well. I've, you know, I think that all of these, uh, all of these interests sort of fuel each other. Yeah. Did, did you make the artwork for the cover of this book? Yes. Oh, it is so good. Thank so you so good. much. I, I really appreciate it. that. Thank it, you. It, it really like it, it, it like automatically tr put me into this world. Like just looking at Excellent. the cover, I could kind of get a feeling. Like, I, I think I know what this is going to be like. And then it, it sort of became that, you know. And then, so then you you made the the commercial, the trailer that's on your website too, right? Yes. Okay. That is so cool. And it has the shark at the very end too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was kind of hoping what it would do is um, not so much um, in – form the way people saw the cave once they got into it, but maybe kind of start to uh, offer a, a suggestion to what it could look like to just sort of uh, get people thinking in that direction, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that like, you know, in Psychopocalypse, when they were promoting this, they were saying that it is their first young adult novel. And I think that when I go in the bookstore and I see young adult covers, I don't really see anything that looks like the artwork for Warren cool yeah 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 so i feel like it's very unique and it stands out and so when they so like did did you go to Insect apocalypse and pitch this story did they have a relationship with you and like said what do you have like how did that work out yeah uh so mark uh who's the, the publisher used to run uh clive barker's company he um he and i met at a uh Spectre Vision event. Spectre Vision is Elijah Wood's horror production company, and they were producers on what was meant to be my first feature. Uh, and so I've known him for probably about seven years ish now. Sure. Um, we've talked a lot about doing various things together. Uh, this idea did start as a, a feature idea. It started as a screenplay, which okay. he read. I think I think probably that many years ago. Yeah. Um, and he was a big fan of it, big supporter of it. And yeah. all I think um, I had various ideas that he was always suggesting, why don't you do this as a, a novel? And it was always on my mind to do a book eventually anyway. Uh, my mom's a novelist. So it was something that uh, I always imagined I would try at some point. Yeah. Um, uh, this one... Uh, now I'm not sure why this one, um, why this one called out for me to do it, tackle it first, except that it was one of, um, one of my most personal and favorite screenplays, 
um, and one that I thought would be the most impossible to get going as a film. Right, um, right. But I, but one that I thought could work really well as a novel. Yes. Um, and so I, he and I had many coffees early on before I started where he would say, yeah, just do it. Why don't you do it? Yeah. Um, he was very encouraging. Uh, so, you know, he was there from the start pushing me to get into it. Yeah. And, and you said it was very personal. I, I know that you, you mentioned that your father had passed away and that sort of inspired this story in general. Yeah. The, the three boys that you mentioned at the beginning, the, the main characters of the story, Ethan, Pete, and Fox, I was wondering, are they all kind of an aspect of you? Are you kind of primarily like Fox? Uh, it, you know, I, I mean, I think I'm probably, I think there are aspects of me in, in all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know which I would say. I, th I think probably there may be there's more me and Ethan than in Fox. Okay. Well, I think probably quite a bit in Fox. Um, but I think all of these characters are taking, uh, taking bits of my friends that I loved as a teenager. Yeah. They're all composites of my friends, really, more even th than they are me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think none really one-to-one -one with any particular friends I had. Uh, although Pete is pretty close to my friend Nick, <laughs> so I think that's that. It, there are uh, other personalities in there, but it's, he's pretty close. The other two boys, I think, are are more of a hodgepodge of my various friends. Yeah, I think that up until the moment where the one character commits suicide, mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like. It, it was a very like it, it really brought me back to when I was a teenager. And I'm I'm 40 now, but it reminded me of when I was a teenager. That like cool. just them coming together. Yeah, yeah, just like you know, going to the the stream and and in the woods and just the way they would talk to each other and the way they would interact. You know, once the suicide happens, things kind of become more heightened and dramatic, and so you know, it's it's more serious. But that that sort of that feeling, I thought it really captured that teenage essence. Great, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah I, I wanted it to be, I wanted those scenes to be, to feel as real as I could possibly manage so that we had this grounding in a, a very real feeling world when it was sort of upended with this fantasy element. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned the idea of um, it being like real difficult to adapt this or maybe to get it greenlit or whatever into a movie. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say that I, I watched a short film that you made called Peopling. Yeah, I, I found it on YouTube, but I know that it's also on uh, Dust, right? That's sort of like a streaming channel. Yeah, on, on their their sister sister uh, network called Alter. So Dust is kind of oh. more sci fi focused, and Alter is more horror focused. It's sa same company, but uh, okay, yeah. right, right. And, and Alter is where I did a little bit of research on you too. And so I, I had a couple of questions based on that film. Okay, and uh, ho hopefully my my film ignorance doesn't show too much but like would you label peopling as like a surreal film or would you put it in some kind of other genre sure i think it would be fair to call it a, a surrealist film i think it maybe has slightly too um too concrete a narrative to be a truly surrealist film i mean i think it, okay. it's surrealist in the sense that um its logic is a little dreamlike and its conceit is a little dreamlike but i think for it to be truly surrealist, I think you have to do away with uh, any logic in narrative. And I think this has maybe a little too concrete a narrative to be truly surrealist. Okay, interesting. Okay, okay. Um, because like one of the things that you, that there's there's like a page that's about you on the uh, Alter website. And there's- Oh, I didn't questions. know that. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's these interesting questions. Like, I, I don't know who interviewed you because it didn't really- uh, reference the interviewer mm -hmm. but like they asked you like if you could pick like Stephen King or Lovecraft who would you pick and mm -hmm. do, do you remember that interview so, vaguely yes vaguely but so so um they asked you at one point if you could make a team of horror movie villains who uh -huh. would be on your team and then you mentioned um the creature Elmer from <laughs> sure, yes right right and yeah. so I was wondering like do you feel like your film is or short film is is similar to that kind of movie? Like uh, that's that was more what I had in mind. You know, yeah. I had 
uh, when I was making peopling, you know, I think that my, the, the particular influences that were shining through there were Frank Hinnenlauter, uh, right. John Waters. Yeah. You know, I th and I was pushing more in a comedy direction with it for sure. Yeah. So, so is that like, are those two guys, like, are they considered like horror comedy? I mean, maybe not, um, you know, you know uh, what's it say? John Waters, but like, mm -hmm. like dark comedy. Is that the idea? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that would be fair for, for both of them. I mean, um, uh, Frank Hinnenlauter considers himself an exploitation filmmaker. Uh, you know, that's my understanding from his interviews. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think, and really, I mean, I don't know what John Waters, I, I haven't heard him refer to his work, but you know, that's, that's how he started too. you know, that I mean, he kind of started the, the midnight shows with his films um, yeah. so, and kind of created the whole exploitation circuit. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, both of those guys, especially with like um, John Waters' Desperate Living, you know, I think we're just sort of into pushing boundaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And making people uncomfortable right. in, in a way that didn't take itself very seriously. Right. You know? I think, and that's not always what I'm looking to do. You know, warmth, I think, it is it takes itself very seriously. But um, peopling was a whole different thing, and and that was, and I just wanted to have fun with it. You know, like they did with their films. Yeah, yeah, and and um, I mean, warmth seems very personal, and then like peopling did seem kind of like you know, it was like kind of like you were like taking a risk with kind of how bizarre it was. Sure. Know? And, yeah. and I think there's something very brave about that to like put a film like that. I mean, because the very first, like the credits in the very beginning, you know, it looks like semen kind of dropping, yes, right? And, right. Yes. And, and it's just like, you know, oh, buckle up. What are we in for right now? And I, <laughs> yeah. I, I like when you make something like that, are, are you like, what, what's the intention behind it? Is it that like, I, I want to show this to the people that are like me, or is it like I'm putting this out there to kind of see what kind of response I'm going to get? Like, because obviously it takes like a lot of effort, money, time to make a movie. Yeah. And, and to make something like that, I think it's it's a very like bold and brave choice. Oh, well, thank you. This will sound false, but I think it's mostly true. I don't often think of what the reaction is going to be when I'm creating something. Okay. Except for my own. I, I'm often thinking about like, how would I react to this? But yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I had a, any sort of conscious, uh, sort of reasoning behind pursuing that idea, uh, yeah. in terms of like what I wanted it to do to an audience necessarily, except gotcha. certain scenes very specifically, I wanted, uh, to, to get a laugh. Right. Um, you know, I, I will say that after it was released, the most exciting thing to me was the people that were not the audience for it, who were exposed to it and had big reactions to it. Yeah. So, so this short um, blew up on Alter and it's got like 33 million views. Part of that is that for whatever reason on, on Facebook, people started sharing it, tagging their friends, tagging yeah friends to freak them out or gross them out yeah, or yeah. whatever uh ta but tagging people that were not the kind of people that would be into it to right, get the right, biggest right. reactions yeah so uh seeing those big reactions was really i think the biggest pleasure of it yeah awesome okay yeah yeah so so essentially like when you're making a film when you're making a short like that it's it's like you just have the idea and you envision it and it's not like I don't care who's going to see it. It's just like, I want to see how I could essentially make this. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very just cool. for the pleasure of the making, really. That is awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have um, an actress from uh, Twin Peaks in it. You have uh, Kimmy Robertson, right? In yeah. the short. And yes. is David Lynch any kind of influence on you at all? Oh, or? oh for sure. Yeah. He's my favorite. Yeah. Big oh. time. Okay, yes. okay, okay. I, I'm sure it probably shows through sometimes a little too much, but he, yeah, huge influence. Okay. I, I, I discovered him, I think, when I was about 12, maybe 13, with uh, Lost Highway. Which, oh, okay. Uh, which I think is woven now into my creative DNA. And yes. so shortly afterwards, my sister got me Eraserhead for my birthday, I think mm -hmm. my 13th birthday. Um, 
And that even more so. Eraserhead, I think, is far and away the best film ever made. Mm. Um, and I think that's in most things I do. Yeah, I, I um, listened to Lynch's, like, it, it wasn't like an autobiography, but it was like, um, it was like, a, essentially the audiobook version of it was like him uh, giving his perspective on things. And then there was like a re recollection of his film career. I forget the heck it's called too, but it's this book that's on Lynch and his films. Um, but I, I was thinking about that when I watched Peopling and, and when I was doing research on you, because like, um, you know, he, he always talks about like ideas just kind of coming to him, almost like you're, you're going fishing and you catch those ideas, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. And and then when, when you were talking about like making Peopling, I was just kind of thinking about when he talked about making a racer head. So it kind of makes sense. Like what you just said. Yeah. You know, ties in, you yeah. Know. And I think I, I do tend to think of creativity in a similar way to him. Yeah. Although I think like the metaphor I would use is a little bit more like pregnancy and that the um, ideas, the ideas uh, are a little bit more like sperms that you, get inside you. you know? Yeah. Well, that just fits with people and just perfectly. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, and warmth too, kind of with the cave itself too. I kind of feel like that, that applies there too. Uh, on your altar page in that interview, there is that question. This is what I was kind of curious about this. They asked you about um, Stephen King and Lovecraft, and you said neither. Like, because the question was like Stephen King or Lovecraft, and you said neither. Yeah. Um, and then you said Dennis Cooper. Oh yeah. Work, I'm not fami familiar with at all, but um, it, it said that he has the George Miles cycle, which mm -hmm. is like very personal essays. And so, like, was that an inspiration for Warmth as well? Yeah, I think maybe not. Um, maybe not directly, but Dennis Cooper is a writer I admire a lot, maybe my favorite writer. I, I, I don't know, certainly in my top five. And yeah. I was reading a lot of him at the time. I think in the space of like uh, three or four months, I devoured everything he'd written. And I think that was about the time probably I gave that interview. Um, I think uh, one of the things he does is he creates uh, very, very believable teams and gives them um, very intense things to deal with. Uh, and, and I think that was, you know, it was, that's was what I was sort of talking about earlier when I said I wanted to create sort of a, a realism that the fantasy could sort of flower from, uh, mm -hmm. there's no fantasy in Dennis Cooper's work, but there is sort of, um, extreme brutality. And I think it's, it feels to me more intense for the realism of the teen characters. Mm. Uh, and I think it uh probably why i brought it up for the answer of that question is that like his his writing is darker more intense uh uh more horrific than anything in an actual horror novel mm, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now i i didn't when i said neither also i wasn't meaning that necessarily as a slight to stephen king or sure uh, or lovecraft because uh, especially with Stephen King, there are things I admire uh, right. and certain books I admire, but neither are a particular influence on me. And if we're going sort of cosmic horror, uh, I much prefer William Hope Hodgson to Lovecraft. Oh, okay. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of even got that vibe when I was reading it. I was like, I don't think that you're just like dismissing those two. It's just that like this guy you'd rather go to, you know, to yeah. Dennis Cooper. Um, in that same interview too um they ask you about how do you prepare for your films and um you mentioned that you make sketches and paintings and then you mentioned these things called lookbooks oh sure I, yeah. didn't, I didn't know what a lookbook was what, what is that oh uh, so lookbooks just like ripped imagery uh from <clears throat> excuse me uh, from films from photographers from artists whoever it's just basically making collages of imagery that where you take these things that exist and sort of put them together in a way that suggests what this new thing will be, what the feel of it will be. Um, so, and they're, they're fairly common for pitching films sure, and, sure. and for pitching, you know, for music videos or commercials or whatever. Right. Um, and I think uh, for me, it's an important part of the process early on I, i'll do it i'll start putting together this these collages um even before i start writing <clears throat> so i get an idea of like 
myself, what, what is the flavor of the thing? I, I want to, I think I need to know the flavor before I get into it. And that's mm -hmm. a good way. Uh, making playlists is another good way. Oh, yeah. um, you know, I think uh, anything that helps me get a specific handle on what the feel of the thing is before I get into it. Um, and, and so it's bit, it's important to my process early on, not just to show the, the work later. Yeah. Did, did the playlist for warmth have like the first two nine inch nails albums on it? Songs uh, you know, I, I think like, um, I, I do adore the first two Nine Inch Nails albums, and I'm sure they were on sometimes when I was writing, but I largely, I was looking for uh, music that ha that mixed a an organic feel with a uh, with an intense sort of brooding uh, vibe, oh, okay. so that you have, um, you have either like very literally sometimes sort of elements of nature, of found sound, um, or otherwise, um, acoustic instruments, uh, uh, something that felt a little more earthy, uh, you know, I, th I think getting away from some of the, uh, the very synthetic stuff I normally listen to mm. just to sort of feel a little bit more grounded in nature as I was writing. You said that you're, you're, you know, the feature hasn't happened yet, you said. Mm -hmm. Um, but is that ultimately what you're working towards at the moment? Yeah, uh, not yeah, not working on the same feature that I mentioned earlier that I was doing with Spectre Vision. That's on the back burner for now. And actually, I started writing that one as a novel as well. That may be oh. the thir third novel. Um, so working on trying to get another feature off the ground right now. I've just been to. I just got back um, day before uh, yesterday from Sitges. Uh, where I was pitching it at a, a co-production market there. Uh, and, you know, only like a month or so before that, I was at Fantasia, um, Frontiers pitching it. So we've got a, a lot of uh, really genuine interest and excitement in this one. It's looking very promising. I, I'm always sort of hesitant to, to be too optimistic because uh, you never know what's going to happen, but uh, it's looking pretty good for this one. We'll see. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So um, are you allowed to like kind of reveal what type of movie it is or anything like that? Or you kind of have to keep the details secret? Uh, I think I could say a little bit about it. Yeah. It's um, sure. it's called A Boy Shaped Void. It's a body horror uh, about a uh, STD that tethers people's bodies. Uh, it te tethers an infector's body with an infectee's body via these spiraled wormholes yeah. um, that become sort of like um, uh, like bodily glory holes in a sense that connect them. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and the the film becomes in a sense a sort of a very strange possession film because uh, the the protagonist is this teenager who's been infected by an older man who's who then has access to his body through these portals whoa okay okay that that sounds kind of awesome actually thank you yeah i think yeah. it's gonna be i think it's gonna be intense and i think it's gonna be fun and strange and um uh, yeah well you know fingers crossed we get it going i think it's looking pretty positive yeah awesome yeah because i mean like when it comes to like horror and, and body horror, I, I think that now the audience is like way more receptive and can appreciate original ideas. Like I, I feel like horror right now is on like this upswing and that like, it's like you're seeing a lot more inventive stuff just in totally. general. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think people are very, uh, have been sort of trending in a direction that's way more accepting of, um, uh, of art house horror and of yes. far out horror and uh, of anything that's um, sort of pushing boundaries. Yeah. Uh, we, we've sort of shaken off. I can remember, uh, you know, five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, there was always this feeling of like, what is the current trend? Uh, in, you know, haunted house movies, whatever, and speculation of what is going to be the next trend. And right. I don't think you could even venture to speculate what the next trend is going to be now, because outside of 
um, studio filmmaking, they're really studio horror. There really aren't trends uh -uh. anymore. Um, and also nobody is that interested in these giant uh, tin pole horror films that the studios are putting out anymore, or at least less interested. You know, I think people, you hear a lot more excitement for these breakout sort of indie successes in the horror world. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like when you were like on Twitter and, you know, there's the whole horror community on there, they're always raving about these smaller horror films versus yes. like the big budget things. You know, like I, this year I could think of like, you know, Pearl and Barbarian and, and then X even earlier in the year. Yes. And, and I mean, there's, there's tons of even more obscure examples than those, but like th those are like kind of the ones that everyone just keeps talking about over and over again. Totally. Yeah. 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 Cool. I think it's exciting. I, I think uh, horror fans like to see something new, you know, they like to, they like a little bit of novelty. Um, so, you know, I think uh, we'll continue hopefully moving even further that direction. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so speaking of like moving forward, if people were exposed to your stuff just now, like through this interview, what could they go seek out right now to like just learn more about you and just like what do you have upcoming that's coming out? Yeah, uh, you know they could go they could take a look at peopling if they're interested. Very very different thing than warmth. Uh, warmth is out as of yesterday. It's in the world, so uh, they could take a look at that. Um, follow me on instagram to see what i'm doing um a boy shaped void has got most of my focus right now that's the feature uh and it's also i didn't mention this but it's also the second novel it's adapted from my second novel um so that's the that'll be the next thing uh at least as a novel coming around the corner and then hopefully as a film yeah um so yeah i mean a couple things out there yeah a boy shaped void is going to be another novel coming out from Encyclopocalypse. Uh, I ideally so. Yes, we're we're starting to to talk about that. Yeah, they're they're looking at it right now, and my my agents are as well. So we'll see. But I would love to do it with those guys. Yeah. Uh, well, Lucas, you know, uh, most of the time when it's writers that come onto the show, I pretty much interview them because I'm the one that reads the books, and Danny, yeah. my my co host, he does all the movie stuff. Um, but I think he would have really enjoyed talking to you as well. Um, and so like if a boy shaped void comes out as a movie, I think he'd love to talk to you too with me. And then cool. if it comes out as a book from Encyclopocalypse, if you, if you want to come back on, I'd love to talk to you again too in the future. I would love that. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. I really appreciate you having me on. It's been an honor. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much. And I hope that, uh, you know, it moves forward, it gets green lit because I'm looking yeah, forward to seeing that as a movie, man. Yeah, thank you. Me too. I hope so. We'll yeah. see. All right. Well, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much.